Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, leave us a comment down below, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. July 9th, 1755. Just after crossing the Monongahela, General Braddock's forces of 1,300 men traveled into a waiting ambush by a force of 900 French Canadian and native warriors. In a battle tantamount to an hours-long bloodbath, General Braddock, along with 900 of his men, would end up as casualties that day, over half of which would not survive the retreat to Philadelphia. The Braddock Expeditions, a multi-pronged strategy to drive back New France from the Ohio country and other British colonial interests, faded away just as soon as it had begun. The British Empire and her colonies were in crisis. If they couldn't rally from the depths of this defeat and mount a successful offensive campaign, large swaths of North America would be forever lost to the French. While the prospect of losing an imperial war to the French was on the minds of the ruling class in London, the now undefended backcountry brought more pressing concerns to the settlers of western Pennsylvania and the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. The lack of a colonial force emboldened hostile native tribes to raid, pillage, and plunder settlements in the Ohio Valley and beyond. With settlers running back across the Blue Ridge Mountain to established towns, Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia sought to take action. Before the end of July, 35 settlers from Virginia had already been reported killed. George Washington, who had by all accounts performed most admirably during the Battle of Monongahela, even after incurring four bullet holes through his uniform by the end of the fight, was left unharmed. Dinwiddie offered Washington full command of the Virginia military with a commission to enlist and train men to operate as a security apparatus against native raiders. Pennsylvania, where the vast majority of the Ohio country in question was located, could not formulate an effective strategy as quickly. With ongoing attacks on settlers taking place, the Quakers raised a thousand pounds to be put towards buying weapons for the frontiers people, but it would be a meager attempt to quell the confrontations. Before the disaster on the Monongahela had even occurred, on June 2nd, a New England regiment had sailed to the Bay of Fundy, Nova Scotia, as a function of the Braddock Expedition's northern campaigns. On June 16th, a large shell cannon shot from the New Englanders struck Fort Busseju, killing six French officers inside. The French surrendered the fort at once. This would be the first offensive victory in colonial Britain in this young war, and it happened with a surprising degree of ease. What followed would have long-term ramifications for the native Acadian population, who had lived an agrarian life and gone about practicing their Catholic faith that they had adopted from the French. The Acadians were then stripped of their land, and some 11,500 of them were displaced, shipped to the British colonies down the coast, and some relocated to Europe. They would also be stripped of their right to practice their faith, and many would act as an insurgent force, funneling arms and intelligence to their French brethren throughout the conflict. William Johnson, a native of Ireland who had moved to New York at a young age to manage an estate that had been purchased by his uncle, was tasked with directing one of the northern campaigns of Braddock's plan. He would head directly north in August of 1755 on the Crown Point expedition. He would rename Lac saint sacrement as Lake George. Johnson would begin construction on Fort William Henry at the southern end of the lake, to be used as a staging area against the French. The French had built Fort St. Frederick, near Lake Champlain, just north of Lake George. This would set the stage for another empirical clash in just a matter of weeks. Meanwhile, in Albany, William Shirley was to head west through Pennsylvania to Fort Oswego with his force of over a thousand men. Shirley was the sitting governor of Massachusetts Bay, and his involvement had been planned as a critical part of the Braddock expeditions. He was to travel north to Fort Niagara and lay siege to it, but along the route he had learned of Braddock's demise and the disastrous results of the Monongahela. Making matters far worse for Shirley was that his son had been serving under Braddock and had been killed in action at Monongahela, shot through the head. Johnson and Shirley had bitter feelings towards one another. Johnson had sent a letter to London that Shirley was not fit for command, citing that he was emotional and reckless. Braddock's orders gave Shirley only a vague command over Johnson, and he would have difficulty getting Johnson to execute his orders. Both men's campaigns would be completely without logistical support from the regular army, leaving their provincial forces to fend for themselves. Shirley learned that the plans for the entire strategy implemented by Braddock were found among the battlefield dead by the French. Fort Niagara would be well aware of the reason Shirley and his men were traveling west. 
Shirley was caught between a proverbial rock and a hard place as, to further complicate his circumstances, 50 miles to the north there were a contingent of native and French forces at Fort Frontenac. If Shirley were to carry on with his plans for Niagara, the French and natives could swoop down and take hold of Port Oswego, trapping Shirley and his men in between themselves and Niagara, and cutting them off from all supply lines and reinforcements. Shirley held a council of war with his officers of Port Oswego, and determined it best to forego the Niagara campaign. He left 700 gravely undersupplied men to hold the fort throughout the winter, then he headed east to New York City. There, Shirley would take over his new role as commander-in-chief for the deceased Braddock, and begin working on raising money and war planning for the upcoming spring campaigns. French allied native forces would take Fort Oswego the following spring, before the snow even had a chance to melt. August 16th saw the arrival of Dieskau at Fort St. Frederick. They had marched from Montreal in three columns, and after establishing his headquarters at Crown Point, he took inventory of the men. 550 men within the fort, along with 1,000 regulars, 1,400 Canadians, and 600 natives making their camp near the structure. Dieskau would take issue with the natives who had joined his force, writing, I encountered nothing but difficulties from the Indians. Never was I able to obtain a faithful scout. At one time, they refused to make any headway. At another time, seeming to disobey me, they set forth and returned within days without bringing me any intelligence. He would instead rely on the Canadians for intel. And on August 27th, word came to him that, quote, 3,000 Englishmen were camped at Fort Lyman, where they were constructing a fort that was pretty well advanced. The presence of Johnson's army was not entirely a surprise to him, as having learned of Braddock's plans, he had anticipated Johnson would march north from Albany. What he did not expect, however, were the sheer numbers of the force under Johnson's command. On September 1st, as the French army contingent moved out, Dieskau was adamant that were Johnson planning to attack, it would happen on the battlefield before they could arrive at Crown Point. Just three days later, Dieskau received intel from a scouting party of Abenaki. They had captured a member of New York's 1st Regiment. During his interrogation, he was extremely forthright with Johnson's plans. He would tell his captors that Johnson had moved 3,000 Provincials and Mohawk warriors to Lake George, and left 500 men back at the fort to finish its construction and serve as its defense. This intelligence brought Dieskau to take decisive action. He gathered 1,500 of his men, roughly half of whom were French-Canadian and the other half native warriors, most of whom were either Abenaki or Nipissing. They sailed down Lake Champlain. Then after landing at South Bay, the French commander took great caution with his overland movement, as the men avoided Wood Creek Road, which would be patrolled with colonial British scouts, and instead opted to cut their own path through the woods hacking away trees and brush as they charted their path ahead in concealed fashion. After two days, they had completed a march of over 30 miles, a journey that had in its own right been no easy task. The plan was for them to scatter and deliver a brutal surprise attack against the British colonials from all sides. Through the night, they advanced in darkened columns, but when the columns became lost in the woods and a wrong direction was taken by the Quanawaga native who was guiding them, a distraught Diascal called off the planned assault. A French general proposed advancing the attack during a council of war he had called while still in the woods. Yet this time, he was rebuked by many of the natives, offering up a variety of reasons for their change of heart. A further agitated Tiascao could not convince them, and he knew any offensive without their assistance would be futile. As their options were assessed, it was decided that they would forgo attacking Fort Lyman and would instead stage an assault on Johnson's camp directly. Meanwhile, Johnson had spent the afternoon discussing the size of the new fortification with his officers, but the topic at hand quickly changed when a group of Mohawk scouts returned to camp with some startling news. The scouts had uncovered tracks leading away from the shoreline at South Bay. The warriors made their way to the Wood Creek Road, but were surprised to find no sign of the men. Returning back to South Bay to investigate further, they came upon three crudely made roads that led through the woods. It became apparent that Diascow was moving his forces on Fort Lyman, yet without the Mohawks actually seeing them, their size could not be accurately assessed. Johnson sent a dispatch to Joseph Blanchard at Fort Lyman, warning him of the impending attack. The rider, a New York wagoneer named Jacob Adams, dashed off, getting within a couple miles of the fort when he found himself in the midst of the French camp. Adams was instructed to halt and dismount his horse. He ignored these calls and carried on attempting to break through. The French opened fire, and after Adams was knocked from his steed, the dispatch was found on his person. 
A group of Mohawks who had heard the events returned later that evening to Johnson's camp with their account of what had taken place. Quote, Gunfire, and then a man called upon heaven for mercy. They judged the man to be Adams. Now, the clandestine chess match between Johnson and Dieskau would finally come to a head. Johnson called another council of war early the next morning, September 8th, and it was decided to send out a single column of 1,200 men composed of Nathan Whiting and the 2nd Connecticut, Ephraim Williams and the 3rd Massachusetts, along with the front of the column being led by 170 Mohawk warriors under the highly revered Mohawk Valley Chief King Hendrick. They were to march south to relieve Fort Lyman. The events that follow would come to be known as the Bloody Morning Scout. Leaving at around 8 that morning, the single column would march, five to six men wide, along the road for half a mile, before coming to a halt to allow the trailing Connecticut men to catch up. During this break, Chief Hendrick would famously turn to Williams and state, in a blunt and matter-of-fact tone, quote, I smell Indians. The warrior then rode back to the head of the column, and the march carried on. Several miles ahead, at roughly 10 that morning, a scouting party reported to Baron de Diascao that they had located the colonial and native column traveling toward Fort Lyman. Diascao then gave the orders to his men to move out, with the Canadians on the right, the French regulars in the center, and St. Pierre and the natives under his command on the left. Diascao's plan was to form an envelopment for the colonials to walk into. He gave strict instructions to his flanking commanders not to allow any fire upon the men until he gave the orders, out of concern that they would let loose early and their enemy would retreat before his forces were able to inflict the decisive blow. The primary concern for Diascao was his native warriors. His dissatisfaction with their intelligence reports, as well as his inability to convince him to follow his orders to attack the fort, gave him doubt about how the morning's events would transpire. Now with his men in place, as Diascao's army waited in absolute silence for the coming envoy, no one was to move until the colonials were within musket fire of the French grenadiers located front and center of the road. At 10.30 that morning, the fevered anticipation would finally cease, as the discharge of a single musket firing cried out through the silence of a hushed morning. While it's still debated who delivered this opening shot, the next moment saw a flood of gunfire unleashed from all parties. Diascao would refer to this as, quote, the moment of treachery, doling the blame upon his native warriors for firing early. Nevertheless, the battle was now underway. The onset of the clash painted an eerily similar picture to Monongahela, with the Ford Column of Mohawks being ruthlessly cut down and the Massachusetts Regiment behind them faring little better. Furthering the chaos and disorder of the Mohawks was the shocking death of their beloved Chief Hendrick. This sent many of the native warriors under his command retreating back up the road through the Massachusetts Regiment, many of whom broke ranks and joined the natives in their retreat. Those who stayed showed an unshakable resolve returning fire as best they could amidst the storm of musket balls and shouts, but they were rewarded for their courage only by being cut down in droves. Colonel Williams attempted to rally his men, waving his sword above his head and barking out orders. He rode to the top of a boulder, ordering them to hold their position, when, just as quickly as the words could pass through his lips, a musket ball sliced through his skull, dropping him stone dead at once. His body was hidden under heavy brush by his men to save it from mutilation, but the effect of his loss was catastrophic. Multitudes of men broke ranks and began fleeing back towards Johnson's camp. Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Whiting and the 2nd Connecticut were all that remained, but charging forward into Diascow's snare would be futile. The quick-thinking Whiting ordered the retreating Mohawks and Massachusetts within earshot, as well as the 500 men of his regiment, to form in lines on the edges of the road taking cover under stone or brush as the terrain saw fit, and stave off the pursuing enemy in a fighting retreat. Given the desperate circumstances and the relatively novice-level training of many of the provincials, the move would be executed in a surprisingly flawless manner. For the better part of the next hour, the colonials fought on, and simultaneously dashed their way back towards their camp. The tables had been turned, and due to the overzealous chase by the Franco-allied forces, the pursuing forces would be cut down in great numbers as they pressed after their retreating foe. Many of the native warriors fighting on the side of the French fled into the woods upon the realization of the counterattack taking place. Lieutenant Colonel Seth Pomeroy, who seconded the strategy of the fighting retreat, spoke of the cunning withdrawal. Quote, we killed great numbers of them. They were seen to drop like pigeons. 
Jacques Legardeur de Saint-Pierre, the commander of the French-Canadian and native forces, was among those slain in the engagement, causing much dismay and further straining the already fraught relations Diaskow held with his native warriors. Just before noon, Whiting's maneuver had the men just within a mile of Johnson's camp, when at last the provincials turned and set upon an all-out sprint for survival towards the encampment. Nathan Whiting had saved more than just the lives of many of his men that day. He also saved Britain from a sequel to the disaster on the Monongahela, and it is likely that he preserved New York from having New France march upon Albany. Upon the arrival of the surviving men back to camp, General Johnson immediately called for every defensive measure to be taken. But the crude defenses his army had been able to construct around his camp would do little to quell the oncoming French onslaught. Johnson ordered cannons and artillery to be brought forward and aimed towards the road, and wagons to be overturned as makeshift breastworks. He then instructed his men to steel themselves for what would be a horrifically violent culmination to the Battle of Lake George. But the many tales of bravery and butchery that compile the saga of the French and Indian War are, for tonight, other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the join button, or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.